Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of the Writer Stack 101 series. My name is Sarah and today we're going to be talking about event streams and some of the different event types that we can start sending in Writer Stack. Writer Stack supports three different types of pipelines, event stream, ETL, and reverse ETL. In this part, we will be focusing more on event streams and event streams will allow us to collect our event data from web, mobile, and server-side applications, then route that data to a variety of different destinations, which can either be our sales and marketing analytics tools and our cloud data warehouse destinations. Now, in this part, we're going to be taking a look at how do we set up an event stream source, mainly using JavaScript. We'll also take a look at some of the different event types that we can send out, and lastly, how we can route those to a destination. To start with, let's head over to the Writer Stack dashboard. As you see, I have a number of connections already set up. Now I'm going to go ahead and set up a new connection. But in order to set one up, I will need to first define what my source is going to be. I currently have a blog website that is really just a simple static site. And I'm looking to capture some user event data from the site to track things like what are the number of site visits, uh, who visited my site, and also what are the main activities that were performed on my site. So I'll get started with this by creating a new source in Writerstock. And this is going to be a JavaScript source that I'm going to configure to connect to a destination. The destination here is going to be a webhook that will send the event data to review the received events that were captured from our site. So first thing we'll do since we're starting out with a new site is let's go ahead and create that new source. So I'll go ahead and select add source from here. And again, in this connection, I'm going to be choosing a JavaScript source. This will load the JavaScript SDK component to my site that will enable it to stream any captured website events directly into Writerstack. So here I'll have to provide a name for my source. At one point, we may end up with multiple different sources and multiple different destinations within our connection page. So it would be helpful if we choose a name that properly describes what the source will be doing, as well as the environment that it's being set up in. As an example, we may want to separate production or dev environment. So it would be very helpful if the name that we pick for the source will include that information, just so we can better keep track of all our connections once our list of connections starts growing. So for this source, I'm just going to be naming this my tech blog. Then I'll go ahead and click continue. Now the source has been created. And you'll see here in the source page that you'll get a write key for your source. This write key is going to be a unique identifier that will be used when you want to later create a connection from the source to writer staff. Now, in order for me to get the code snippet or the SDK, I'll have to click here on guide, which will take me to the setup guide. Now, this will be our go-to documentation for really anything JavaScript SDK related. From here, I'll go to the quick start guide, and you'll see here a step-by-step -step guide for how to load the JavaScript SDK to the site. So what I'll do now is I'll just copy over this code snippet. You'll see here there's an option for a minified and a non-minified code. I'll just copy this over and paste it into my editor. So now let's take a closer look at what this code snippet is doing. So this code will do a number of things. First, it's going to be loading the SDK, and it's also going to be initializing the list of events that I can start sending. So you'll see here in this array, uh, this is going to be iterating over all the different event types that can be used to capture different event data from our site. You'll also see here in the bottom that you'll have to provide the right key for your source and the data plane URL for your writer stack account. Make sure when plugging those in that they are enclosed within quotation marks, since that will be needed for it to work. You'll notice here that we are calling two different methods, the load call, which will load the SDK to the site, and also a page call. And this is what's going to be used later to capture events related to page views whenever a user visits a site. So let me actually plug in the right key and data plane URL now. So now I'll go back to my source, copy over this right key, and also do the same for the data plane URL, which I will be getting from my connections page. What I'll do right now is I have to insert this code snippet into the head element of my HTML code of my site. So uh, let me head over here to the head element and paste this code over here. Now, once this is done, I should now be able to ingest some events to Writerstack. And here we've, we're, we're only calling one method, which is the page method. And this is going to be capturing page event data related to the page views and sending them to Writerstack. So I'll go ahead and save. 
Now let's head back to my source page. In order for me to verify that my events are successfully being captured, we can use this live events viewer. This is a great tool that you should definitely keep in your toolbox for debugging purposes or to simply view the content of the different events as they're being ingested within the source in real time. So this is my live events viewer and this is where I'll start seeing the events come in as they are being captured from my site. Now, if I go back to the tech blog website, which I've installed the Rudderstack JavaScript SDK to, I should be able to start generating the first page call events by doing a refresh on the site. So if I click on refresh here and go back to my live events viewer, I should be able to see the first page call event come in. Now I'll notice here a single event type, which is the page call, because that is the only method that I've called within JavaScript SDK earlier. And if I click on this event, I should be able to see the payload with all the fields that were automatically captured by writer stack from my site. Now, if we take a closer look at the contents of the payload, we'll see a number of different fields. Some of those fields are common fields across different types of events, such as the anonymous ID, the context object, and the event type here at the bottom, which indicates type of event. In our case, this is a page call. One thing to note here about the anonymous ID is that Rudderstack will assign this to each visitor that browses the website anonymously. You'll also notice here in the properties field, it will include things like the referrer, uh, the path, and the title. Those are things that Rudderstack will capture automatically for page calls. And optionally, I can also pass any additional custom properties within this that will be helpful for describing my events. So in addition to the ones that Rudderstack captures, I can also add my own events by basically just saying, here, well, I want to provide that the context of this page is a home page. And also, this is going to be a tech blog. Then refreshing this page again. Now, if I go back to my live events viewer and look at the contents of the properties field, I should start seeing here that two extra fields have been added, which are the category that I just assigned and the name for the website, which I assigned as tech blog. Now, again, this is just a simple example, but this is one way we can add our own property to the list of properties that are automatically captured by Rudderstack. So page calls are a really great way to get started and to get information around how many site visits we are getting. Those are usually included by default within the SDK code snippet that we insert into our website. However, sometimes that's not enough. We might need to get a bit more information. Like we wanna know things like what were the visitors mostly interested in when they visited our site? what links were being visited, what buttons were being clicked, and if any forms were being submitted, such as a contact us form or a request demo form. For capturing those types of events, we need to use a different type of event, which is called a track event. This usually helps site owners and marketing folks understand the journey that the visitor took that led to a favorable outcome, like a purchase being made or a sales lead being identified. So let's go back to my tech blog site. Let's say within the site, I want to track a few things like whenever a user clicks on this learn more button a track call can really be helpful in identifying those activities that the user is performing so i'm going to go ahead and add a track call to each one of those button clicks so basically here i've added this track call which is going to be fired up whenever a user clicks on the learn more button and you'll see here that the track method is very similar to the page method that we've added at the beginning, uh, with the exception that the track call will actually need a name for the event that it will be tracking. In this case, I've assigned it a name, which is learn more button click, which means that whenever a user clicks on this learn more button, this is going to be fired off with the name of an event, which is the name that we passed over here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this and then go back to this blog page. And within the blog page now, I'm going to go ahead and click on refresh and then I'll click on the learn more button. So if I go back to the Rudderstack live streams page, I should be able to see that both a page call and a learn more button click track call have been fired off. By looking at this track call, I'll notice that the payload is very similar to the one that, that is captured by the page calls, with the exception that this will have the type track and it will also have a name for the event, which is learn more button clicked. Other than that, it will capture the same fields, which are the information related to the page in which those events were captured on, and also the anonymous ID, 
which is the same anonymous ID that will be captured from page call event as well. So one thing that you'll notice about both page and uh, track calls is that at the bottom, there's another ID field that has a blank value. The difference between this field and the anonymous ID field is that the anonymous ID is going to be automatically assigned whenever a user browses a site anonymously without them being signed in, without them having submitted any forms to the site, which could indicate their identity or associate them with a user ID. So the user ID will actually remain blank until we use an identify call and pass a number of different traits, which will then associate the user ID with the anonymous ID and track any previous and subsequent events to this user ID. An identify call is something we'll fire off after a user signs in with their email or maybe submits their information within a website form like this one. Now, this is intended for us to be able to, to associate an identity to whoever has visited our site and also map any activities that were carried out to that identity. All right, so now let's take a look at an example of using identify calls to identify anonymous users based on information that can be captured from them filling their information in the contact form for our site. So based on what we've seen before, all the different events that are being generated currently have a blank value for the user ID. This value will remain blank until we generate identify calls. So right now in this example, we're going to be using the email as the user ID to provide an identity to each user based on the information that they're filling out through this form. Now let's take a look at the code that we will be using for this. So here we are going to be uh, capturing the email and the name as well as the message from this contact form. And we're going to be passing all of those different variables here as values to both an identify call and a track call. If we go to this documentation here, I can look at the syntax for this identify call. You'll see here that in the first parameter, we're always passing what the user ID will be, which is the value that's going to be given to user ID, which is currently blank. And I can also see that I can pass traits that will be used to further describe a user and provide more context to their identity. So that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm passing this email as a user ID, and I'm also passing a traits object via this call as well. So whenever a user clicks on this send message, this identify call is going to be fired off. And I'm also going to be firing off a track call with the event name uh, form submitted to indicate the message that was also sent by this user. Okay, so let's go ahead and try an example of this. I'm going to be providing here and my name as an input. I'll also provide an example for an email. Uh, let's say it's s at rotorstack.com. And then for the message, I can say, hello, I'd like to learn more about training. So I'll go ahead and send this message. And again, this should now trigger both an event call and an identify call. So now I should be able to see that both those events uh, were fired off. So if we look at identify call right now, we should be able to see that the user ID has now been associated with this call. So we'll see all the same values, all the same fields that were captured as before, but now we actually have traits within the context object and we also have a user ID. So now any subsequent calls, such as this event call, will also have this user ID because it's going to be mapping any events or actions that are being done on the site to this user ID as well. And now if I go ahead and generate some more page calls by refreshing the page, I should be able to see that those page calls will also have that user ID that was passed by running different identify calls. And so once we've seen how to send different types of events from our source via JavaScript SDK to Rudderstack, and also how to use the live events viewer to verify that those events are being captured from our site. So let's actually also try sending those events to a destination. So, so far, all we did really is that we've ingested those events to our source. And if I go look at events here, I should be able to see the total number of different events that were ingested via a specific time frame. Now, I also need to be able Able to send those events to a specific destination. Currently, I do not have any destinations connected. I can either connect it to any one of my existing destinations. And again, each source might have multiple different destinations here. So I may choose to send those events directly to Google Analytics, and I may send them also to my cloud data warehouse, which could be a big query instance as well. So for today, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to be sending those events to a webhook destination. So a webhook destination 
information is really helpful to implement because I may want to send my event data to a destination that might not be available within the list of router stack in integrations. The good news here is that if this destination supports webhooks, we can easily set it up as a webhook destination and start sending data to that webhook to trigger off then different actions based on it on the application side. So all I need to do here is provide a URL for my webhook. For testing purposes, I'm going to be using webhook.site, which is a really good site that enables us to test out and look at the payloads of our received events just to verify that this connection is working. So I have this already set up. I'm going to go ahead here and click on continue. And now every time I actually refresh this page, and generate a new event, I'm going to start seeing this event uh, come in. I have a new event that came in uh, with the anonymous ID that was generated and the user ID that was associated with the user identity that was captured via the contact form. So with that, we've seen how do we set up a source using the JavaScript SDK. We also learned about the different types of events that we can send out and how to route those to a destination and also how to verify that those events were received within our webhook destination. So that's really it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned for the next one where we'll go through how do we set up a cloud data warehouse destination for our source data.